Is refashioning upcycling a new idea? No. Well, I guess that didn't take as long as I thought it would. This idea that refashioning and upcycling is a new idea came up recently when I was uh, sharing some stories, literal stories, from uh, this Australian Girls' Own Annual from 1918. And in it, it was a description of some garment refashioning. I was sharing these stories and I was just quite overwhelmed by the amount of comments and DMs I received from people so surprised to see that refashioning was done all the way back then. It's actually perhaps maybe the opposite of what you think. Refashioning, repurposing, repairing, mending, remodeling, all of these things that have actually been done all throughout history very consistently as a part of life until maybe the last 60 years that it has actually gone out of fashion and kind of forgotten. I thought it would be fun to let's go through some of the history of refashioning and some of the research I have and just sort of have a look at just how old this idea of refashioning, remodeling clothes actually is. Welcome back my lovely ladies and gents. If we haven't actually met yet, my name is Evelyn Wood and I'm a dressmaker and I specialize in what I am humbly coming to call the art of garment renovation. Why is that? Because in all of the uh, old sewing books that I have, they actually call refashioning, upcycling, garment renovations. But more on that in a little bit. I thought it would be really fun to actually go through some of these books that I have and talk with you about this topic if is refashioning new. As I said, this idea of refashioning and renovating garments is not new. It's something that has been done as an essential part of life really for all throughout history until maybe the last 60 years. There's probably two reasons that, that I think maybe the main contributors uh, and of course it does coincide with the rise of fast fashion and uh, why this has gone out of fashion and we don't do this anymore. I will show you all of these great examples that I have and uh, the actual you know 1918 version of one of my thrift to vintage episodes is right here. I'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Let's go back even further and sort of talk about how as humans we used to value textile materials far more than we do now. They have absolutely zero meaning to us now, but once upon a time they were so expensive and so valued. There is a fantastic example that is from about the 7th or 8th centuries. It is an extant garment, so that means an original from the time, that was preserved in, uh, it was a bog body that was uh, dug up and the garments and textiles were remarkably preserved and it is like gives us a great insight into the garments of the time. This one is particularly interesting from, let me get this right, the Mern from Bernersfeld in Germany. I'm going to put the link down below so you can go find out how to say this properly. It has been dated to the 7th or 8th century. So this is really old. Now the tunic found on this man has 45 pieces, single pieces of cloth that make up this one tunic top. 45 pieces. And there are 20 different fabrics on all those pieces with nine different weaving patterns. Just think about that for a minute. So when you see the example and they've recreated the actual, like all of the patches here, it's basically a patched together tunic. That's how many times this has been repaired 45 times. It has been repaired with patches on it. It's incredible with 20 different types of fabric. I've always remembered this example as just something really remarkable because it just shows how much value was put in a textile item in a garment uh, from the 7th or 8th century. That's how much we valued a tunic is to repair it 45 times, literally pieced together. You're probably thinking, well, that was so long ago, of course, we didn't have anything back then. 
To move forward a little bit more in time to give you another example, the best example that comes to mind is in an episode of A Stitch in Time, uh, Amber Butchart uh, was describing, and I cannot remember which episode this was, I'm going to put a link below so you can actually watch them all. It's a fantastic series. I think you'll really enjoy it. In one of these episodes, she was examining an extant uh, example of the king's overcoat. I forget the time period, but it was something probably around the 15, 16 or 1700s, that kind of e era. And this is the king's coat. So it was so lavish. It had frills, bows, silks, pearls, all sorts of like everything that you can imagine, of course, was on this coat uh, as a decoration. And even on the king's coat, when you looked at it, it has these odd little seams at the back, like only on one side and not the other. Really curious. It's because they have actually pieced together the pat to create the pattern pieces they needed. So they didn't waste any fabric. If you could cut a little bit of the, the pattern piece out of this little scrap here, you did that even on the king's garment where no expense was spared, right? You would be piecing together um, the, fa the, the fabric to create the garment and have an odd seam here or there. It was ex completely acceptable for this to happen. I mean, if it happens on the king's garments, of course it happens all the time. And could you imagine that now? That's unheard of especially on a king's garment. We don't even do that really in fast fashion because we have zero value on fabric and the cost of it. It's become so cheap that it just does not have the same value as it once did. I think that this is a fantastic example of just how much value we used to put in uh, fabric and textile and garments in general, that even on something as lavish as a king's coat, you would still piece it together to use every scrap of fabric that you could. But let us move back forward in time again to something a bit more practical. I'll give you a more practical example of some refashioning throughout history. So let me take you to this, uh, the girl's own annual. Now this is dated, well, in the cover it's written to Janice with love from mum and dad, Christmas 1918. So unfortunately this book is in very poor condition, but it is basically a collection of, um, little articles are separated into months. So you have, I guess, the idea is that you would read this over the entire year, each month having something new because uh, every month is like a little, its own magazine kind of article in here. And there's, there's tips on, you know, they have short stories, there's tips on housekeeping, cooking, fashion and some garments, um, how to sew children's clothes, tips for what you should grow in the garden at that time of year all sorts of things of that nature. And the part that I shared with my uh, Instagram audience that uh, sparked all of this was a section here uh, under the clothes calendar. Now it says renovating old blouses and it goes into uh, several paragraphs of how the uh, writer here, how she remodeled three of her blouses because they were well, she says, the one thing which really dates a blouse is its sleeve and the sleeves in the flannel ones, which I had in hand, though in no way exaggerated, still were a great deal fuller than those worn at the present time. Also, the necks were considerably lower than they should be in nowadays. So it goes on and I, uh, I will actually read you this uh, later on at the very end, but you can understand it goes through describing the renovation of some beautiful blouses that she had. And it's just, it's delightful to read, it really is. It reads just like an episode of one of my Thrift to Vintage episodes here on YouTube, but it is the 1918 version of one of those. It's really missing pictures. I wish it had pictures to accompany this. And so this here, the idea of renovating your blouses to be a new item is right here in print in every month in 1918. It is absolutely common practice. You would not just throw it away because it became out of date. The most common thing to do was in fact mend it, repair it, alter it a little bit, refashion it, or as they called it back then, renovating it to be something new and more delightful for the modern taste. So all of my older sewing books, I happen to have all chapters, I even have an entire book, 
on mending and garment renovations. In all of my newer, more modern sewing books, funnily enough, all of those chapters tend to be missing quite frequently and there's only one or two that actually include those types of things in a complete sewing book. Let me show you some other cute ones. In the dressmaker here from 1916, we have a whole chapter on darning and mending. It goes into great detail with pictures because again, an essential part of life is mending your clothing. And in this one right at the back, there is a chapter on, they call remodeling in this one. And they also have some uh, pages on the care of garments as well, how to care for different things, which is fascinating. So a little bit more modern again. Uh, this is the Pictorial Guide to Modern Home Dressmaking. And in here is an entire chapter on garment renovations. There's that name again that I just love. This one is delightful. It goes into so much detail showing you, uh, giving you ideas of how to change up old skirts, how to change up summer dresses into something new. Um, you know, once the armholes are worn out, what do you do with your dress at that stage? Men's suit to woman's suit. Like there is a significant portion of this book dedicated to garment renovations. From the same series, The Pictorial Guide to Needlecraft, they also give beautiful examples of how to renovate old skirts, giving you ideas of how to give something new life and the common types of things, what you can do to reinvigorate it and to just give it a new life and extend its life. Even a page here on repairing bed linen. We come to this one is from 1954. Uh, successful dressmaking and in here at the back we have an entire chapter again on renovating and mending again examples of how to renovate in modern style give things a fresh new look and once they're worn out what do you do to extend the life of those garments because those garments you have are valuable we used to make good things and value them I even have an entire book here thrift with a needle this entire book is dedicated to mending and renovating clothing. This is one of my favorites by far. It just goes to show you how much part of life actually mending and garment upcycling, refashioning, renovating actually was part of life. It was needed, it was a necessary skill. And I think it's very clear that all of the modern sewing books missing all of these chapters on mending and renovating is clear that is something we just don't do anymore, right? So I guess the next real question is, why is that then? Well, I have two thoughts on the matter. I don't think there, I think there's a many things that would contribute to it, but I think there's two main points that I think might have um, helped the situation come to where we are. And that is, it's generally about the last sort of 60 years that it's become out of fashion to refashion. In my experience looking at different sewing books and just in general, the, when I talk to people about this uh, of different ages, the kind of responses I get has led me to um, come to sort of this, uh, not conclusion, but this idea of perhaps why, is that uh, it's generally the last sort of 60 years. And that means uh, generally about the baby boomer uh, generation grew up like repairing that these are like their parents were doing these things from these books. So they were mending, repairing, they were wearing secondhand out of more necessity because it's, you know, a time after war. So there was, you know, less things um, that were available. So that was quite common to wear thrift and mend things. And so as the baby boomers grew up and, and the countries in which mostly they come from, let's say the US as most of you guys, Australia, UK, these countries became wealthier and wealthier and normal, like your regular person became wealthier and wealthier as well. And therefore, as they grew up, when they were able to afford more, they didn't want to buy second hand. They want to buy something new, we can afford it. Like. You want to buy new because you can afford it. It's a luxury. It's great. It's a good thing that we can afford new things. If it's get tired and worn out, we want something new, which, you know, like, of course you would, you would come to that conclusion after having have to wear secondhand clothes or when you're a kid, you would want your own kids to have the best, of course. 
And so the other reason I think that we've come to not uh, mending and repairing so much is of course the loss of skill uh, and the rise of fast fashion. I think they sort of go hand in hand together. Uh, sort of since maybe, let's call it maybe the 80s onwards that this has been becoming faster and faster as we go along. The skill of mending and sewing has not been passed on to generations, whereas it once was. So when your parents don't teach you how to sew and it's not something that you do, you don't learn, and then when you have kids, you're not going to teach them how to sew because you don't even know yourself at that point, right? It's taught less and less in schools that it's not something that is valued as being able to repair clothing or sew. It's so It's just like a loss of skill. And of course now we have fast fashion coming into um, into the to the scene where garments are made very quickly on mass readily available and so cheap I mean why would you bother repairing it when you can just buy a new one for ten dollars right but that is a whole other conversation I think to be had but of course you are here because you and I think a little bit differently and we do value our clothes and I think that in the past I don't know, five years, there has really been a resurgence in mending and taking care and putting more value on our clothes because it has become, as every, all of us become more aware of the impact of the fashion industry and the waste that we have from both fashion and in, and in general. Particularly throwing away plastic clothing is like double whammy, right? And so we're more aware that we cannot be doing this anymore and that's why there is more of a resurgence I think now in refashioning and upcycling and garment renovations. Which is really really great because obviously it's one of my passions and what I love to teach and it's one of the reasons I love it so much too. So if you thought this idea of upcycling and refashioning and renovating your garments is something that's new because you've only seen it come about in the last let's just call it five years or so. Actually, it is not. <laughs> it is something that has been forgotten for some years and thankfully is on a return back into our common practice of what we do with fashion, which I really, really happy about, obviously. I hope that gave you a little insight and if it is something that you like and enjoyed listening to me talk about, do let me know because uh, I could do something again or otherwise I won't do this ever again. But mostly I'm really, really interested to hear what you think about uh, why we do not uh, refashion or mend, why it became out of favor so much because I know I have a wide range of audience here from teenagers to people regularly tell me they're in their 60s and 70s learning to sew. So I would love to hear your experience of what it was like when you're growing up, why you think that we don't do this anymore. I'd love to hear your thoughts below in the comments. And another question for you is, do you like the term garment renovation? Like using this old fashioned term, I like it. I'm wondering if you like it so much because maybe we could actually turn it into like our thing instead of saying, you know, having to tag yourself with a refashion with everybody else's refashion. Maybe we could do garment renovation, something like that. Let me know what you, th what you think about that. Please like this video if you liked it. And if you know someone who might be interested in this topic, I would be so grateful if you shared it with them. Thank you so very much for watching as always. And until next time, bye. And now for those of you that have stuck around just to hear it, a excerpt from the Girls' Own Annual from 1918, the clothes calendar for hints for your wardrobe in November. Renovating old blouses. First of all, I began with three woolen blouses. I carefully looked over these and found that they were without a sign of wear and that their color was good and had not faded or run in the washing. The advantage of buying good material at the beginning. I cannot understand how it is that women's fashion change so rapidly. It is all very well for people to say, don't bother about the fashions, but be thankful you have something to wear. Well, I am thankful that I have something to wear, but at the same time, I hate to be out of fashion. The one thing which really dates a blouse is its sleeves, and the sleeves in the flannel ones which I had in hand, though in no way exaggerated, still were a great deal fuller than those worn at the present time. Also the necklines were considerably lower than they should be nowadays. Having decided all of this, I took up my scissors and began to rip. First out came the sleeves, 
next off the, the collar and using a hot iron, I pressed out what creases I could from the material. I ripped the sleeves to pieces, taking off the cuffs, which were double ones, and opening the seam, laid them flat on the table. By the aid of a pattern, I recut the old sleeves, doing away with the fullness at the shoulder. For the cuffs, I carefully unpicked them, and joining the two separate pieces together, I pressed them quite flat, and cut out the new gauntlet cuff, part of the same pattern, and lined them with nain sook in lieu of the viola, of which, of course, I did not have enough. I inserted the sleeve into the blouse and stitched it on the right side by machine, so making a flat seam all the way around the armhole, which gave a very tailored effect. The cuffs I finished off with tiny pearl buttons. Now for the collar.